Good morning, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and get us started here and get us up to our content. There'll be people logging in a little bit. Welcome to our Digital Services Forum Biweekly. We're going to talk today about modeling microservices and APIs in the CSDM. This has been a topic that you know Charles and Jason and I have been getting a lot of questions about. So we thought we'd bring in some of the experts and then... Um, we have a guest today that's going to be talking about a specific problem they're working on with this as well. So I'm excited about today's, today's content. We have a little custom here. If it's your first time, if you would drop a name inside the uh, chat, that would be great. We, we keep track of that, and we go back and look at the logs and let everybody welcome you to the group if, if it's your first time. I, I will post a link that will the inside, I do this at every meeting, but I'll, I'll post this link that gives you access to everything on our community. So basically the four things you'll get is you'll get access to the Zoom registration, also access to our instance, access to past meetings, and then a YouTube playlist that lets you go back and see any of the prior meetings. Okay, so that, that will be in the chat, so you'll have that. I want to take you back to one of the sessions just to set some context for our speakers today. But um, back in December, we talked about a roadmap, road mapping our CSDM capabilities. And um, I provided this link inside of the forum. Like once we go to the forum, once I post the video, I also post any of the content. This content has over a thousand downloads on it. So I wanted to bring it up again because it's really relevant to today's conversation. What we talked about in this session back in December was that what you're modeling really doesn't matter until you can give it to somebody to use it. And we talked about all the use cases like the, the collaboration between a CSDM designer, uh, whatever your role is doing that, and an incident manager, the incident process owner, or the change process owner, or the security process owner, or the catalog process owner, and so on. Right? Until somebody's consuming your models, consuming that data to improve a process, there's really no value in it. So we talked a lot about that here. And I, I think today we're gonna have our speakers, and that was what really attracted me to this use case. So Richard coming over for Banner, and he'll talk about somebody that came to him and asked him for this data. They need it for certain processes that they're working on. And then Mark will give, um, because it's around APIs and microservices, there's some things that we have now that we can do to create models, and there'll be additional capabilities in the future. So we're going to talk about both of those as we go forward. So first we're gonna have Richard set us up. He's gonna talk a little bit about the people that came to him, asking him about the model uh, for their use cases. And then Mark is gonna respond with, again, what we have now and what we have later. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Richard, and you can get us started with that problem statement that uh, you talked to us. I think it was last November that you brought this up. So it's great work getting, uh, getting you on to talk about it. Yeah, and before I start sharing, I wanted to, speak to what you just said about value because for a while we were all focused on is the data right is the data right is the data right and keep fixing data and the data kept breaking because nobody really understood the value of what we were trying to do and we've made that that shift back in about november you came out and we made that shift and it's been all the difference in the world we have a lot of engagement from our it application owners now i've got people calling me wanting in on this right so which is a big difference from forcing people to fill out spreadsheets <laughs> so, so anyway i appreciate that john that was very uh great information and and we acted on it so excellent so let me go ahead and share and let's make sure i share the right thing i want to share this one let me know when everyone can see that. Looks good, Richard. Okay, so so what what John was saying is what brought this up was uh, we had a, a conversation. I'm going to say back in October with our cyber department, and what they were concerned with is being able to track APIs 
And, and we actually had a, a vulnerability that was discovered through one of our APIs. It was caught very quickly through our SOC. Um, ha however, they, it took them a large amount of time to be able to relate that back to who was using that, who built it, where is it being stored, all those kinds of things. And so they reached out to us and go, hey, we would like to be able to record this. We need a CI when these things happen so that we can manage these things on their end. And then if you think about it um, beyond that, is that today they're, they're, um, they're using a third-party app to do this, and there's no integration between that 30 third-party app and what, what we're currently doing in Snow. And that third-party app is just not scalable for an enterprise-wide um, uh, environment. And um, so therefore, we and nor is it relatable back to actually anything. It's just they're seeing APIs. And and today we're just, they're, they're struggling with and only able to track those external calls being made through those things. And they want to be able to do all of them. And at the bottom down here, I put, I think the time to speak about that, right? It's, we have that same situation with certificates, right? And certificate management where cybers, you know, they're, they're, they have their own tool for doing that. They're doing the best they can, but we still have certificates expiring at midnight. And we all know the result of what happens when that happens. Basically, we have an app that goes down. And now we've got, a, we've got everybody up at two o'clock in the morning trying to figure out what's going on. And nothing really drives anybody towards seeing the fact that that information is missing. And it's a simple problem, just the CI. We may spend hours trying to troubleshoot and look for the problem only to find out, well, the cert surprise uh, uh, was uh, suspended. So uh, the other one is the uh, we're doing some modeling. Um, I won't say we're doing service mapping yet. We're kind of precursor to service mapping, but we're doing some application modeling. And, and in that modeling exercise, we're, we're in conversations with IT application owners, we're discovering that, well, this interfaces with this, and then there's an integration here with this, and these are API calls, or there's data shared between apps. So that, from an APM perspective, that's why we're trying to figure out what's the right way to be able to record that information inside of ServiceNow. And then as you can imagine, from, from, from a change in incident process perspective, there is a dependency on those CIs. And when we don't have CIs for certs and we don't have CIs for APIs, it, it makes very difficult to track, you know, they're picking something, uh, uh, there, there are other CIs being selected because there's no direct CI to link it to. So that's another thing that we're trying to solve for. A any questions about any of that? Okay, so in the, in the next slide here, let me see if I can get it to advance. No, nope. hang on, sorry. So in the next slide, I'm just showing you an example of what we're what we're talking about here. And at the top, we have uh, an application called Acuity. And I'm sure this is rudimentary for a lot of your folks on this call, right? But we have a production and QA environment for that application. Uh, there's two components that make up that app. There's an Acuity Connect and an Acuity, Acuity Advanced Care. And then those, uh, those are broken down into the smaller pieces where we have a Tomcat server, an Apache server, and a database server that all make up that prod instance of Acuity Connect. And we have a database server that makes up Acuity Advanced Care. But if we follow the lines down, this is where the question came to, to John and to Mark was the fact that, hey, I found this thing in my PDI called APM Digital Interfaces and Integrations, and how can I take advantage of it? And please keep me from doing the wrong thing. And that's how we got to today. But in what I'm trying to show here is that in initial conversations with the IT application owner, uh, MCG was so seen as part of the Acuity app and not necessarily a thing that needs to be tracked on its own. It was just seen as an another application service. So what we've been able to do is classify this as a business app with these being part of the service that runs on with this and that it's a SaaS app. And that's where that API call is being made. So this, these particular interface servers are making an API call out to this subscription service out on the cloud. 
that data is then being retrieved and it's being put back in here and it's being consumed by Acuity Advanced Care. And in that app, there's a button that they push on. And the purpose behind this app is for when you, when you a uh, doctor asks for a treatment to be uh, paid for through the insurance plans, the on-prem doctors here at, at Banner or in other institutions have a place to go to say that the standard of care is to do the following. It matches up to what the doctor's requesting and they approve it. And then we also have an instance here where we're trying to, we, we're, we run Cerner and we're trying to, we exchange data between Acuity and Cerner patient information. And we want to be able to register this and show that relationship that this app shares data with Cerner. This app is dependent upon a SaaS app to return things for its for it to be able to provide its uh, capabilities back to the end users, and that's kind of what drove this whole conversation with John. How how do I how do I go beyond this simple diagram and take advantage of some of the more important things inside of that? And here I'll show you an example. This is what I'm talking about. This is my PDI, and in my PDI you'll see that under APM and we do own APM is we have this digital interfaces and this integrations. And there's a few YouTube videos, but they're pretty sparse on, uh, I mean, they show what you can do to put data in, but it really doesn't talk about long-term use and how to map it back to the app and all that stuff. So, so my question is, how do we use these features in, in the APM module? And then in talking with uh, John, right, is what is the future direction for managing APIs and microservices so that we, don't do anything today that we're going to regret because we all hate that. So, and with hey, Richard, that, can you, yep. Can you go back real quick to your diagram with Absolutely. Acuity Connect? Yep. There's a question here. What's the difference between Acuity Connect on this and um and Acuity Advanced Care? So there are actually two parts of the app. So one is a one is a one is a one that uh, they log into which is the Acuity Connect. So uh, the insurance uh, folks that take your phone call, uh, that's where they go. They log into this web front end and that's how they access the app. This is more of a back end thing where they do the approvals. So this is the, this is the patient contact, I guess you could call it. And the advanced care is the actual approval and managing the, author, the prior authorizations in that system. Thanks. Makes that sense. was Billy's question. I hope we got it. Yep. Um, this I think that was the only question. Initial use. Yep. There's more. Uh, we'll we'll bring you back on later if uh, yep. we go through. No more. Okay. I'm going to stop yeah. sharing and. And thanks, John. I I had asked that because I was just wondering if it might be better as separate applications. Um. And then I would assume your back end is probably where you have your interface. Yeah, so right? we, yeah, we didn't do separate applications because they actually are have different cost structures. They have different support structures, right? And all those kinds of things that doesn't apply here. It's the same team supporting it. It's all paid for, through one entity. Um, so we, we didn't feel we needed to split it up. So, and they actually, yes. and, and explaining that to the IT application owner, it's, less maintenance, uh, we were able to achieve the results that we want, right? From an application rationalization perspective and managing costs and all that, we, we felt that just the one was all was needed, so. Okay. We do have other examples of other apps where what you said is absolutely true, right? Where we had to split them up. Um, but in this case, it, it's just how we rolled with this one. But is it your acuity advanced care that that's where your interface is? Uh, One of them, right? So, so that is just a, a that's kind of I guess you can call it more the back end application part of it, right? It's it's all one app. It's just one part is the back end, one part's the front end. I think that's the easy mm -hmm. way to explain it. So. so, I'm sorry if I missed this. The the um when your prod. Acuity Connect and Acuity Advanced Care, does that install software or is that just the classification of the software that's on the server systems? 
So that is, so from the vendor's perspective, right? That's what they sell. They'll sell you Acuity Connect and they'll sell okay. you Air, right? So. Right, okay. But since it's all by the same team, has one IT application owner, one support group, all that kind of stuff, we just went with the one business app. Okay, all right. Thank you. And so this is being, um, this is just the CI. Is, is that how you're representing it within the, your database, your, your backend system? Yeah. So the, the business app and then the application services. So these are all my application services, right? And then right. Those services are running on this particular hardware. This is kind of more of a block diagram just for the purpose of us being able to input the data and get the data corrected. Because when we roll this out, it was just, we hit people with a stick and said, here, please fill out all these fields, right? Yeah. With not really anybody really understanding the value behind that or trying to get that. And that's where I go back to what John was saying is that we took a different approach rather than just filling out stuff. We started showing people, hey, by doing this, uh, you can imagine at two o'clock in the morning, having even this, this diagram available to you, it, it's worth its weight in gold. And that's where we've gotten everybody's buy-in is that, oh my God, we've never had this before, right? And to have yeah. this available, and we're tying this back as an architectural artifact through Lucidchart. So. So in your, um, your diagram, so rows two and three are application services and yeah, they're stacked kind of, as, as parent and child? Yeah, it, they're kind of just, uh, th this row really doesn't exist, right? This This here doesn't really exist. It's really this, right? So we entered this, we come in through the through the uh, through the um, uh, through the hardware, right? And it, and discovery finds this, and we label it and we establish that relationship. So, is row four are those server CIs? These are server CIs, correct? Yes. Oops, sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. These are your server CIs. This is the CI for the application service. This is really just a logical representation so that we can keep the conversation with the IT application owners uh, aligned, <laughs> right? And so really, okay. this, this really doesn't exist in ServiceNow. It's just, it, this maps down to this, so. Got it. You mean okay. row, you. row three doesn't really exist? Uh, well, yeah, it doesn't because what this is, is that this, this runs on this, right? Is the way to look at it. So if I was to look yes. at 7506, I would know that 7506 is my Tomcat server that provides Acuity Connect, and it's the prod instance. All right. Okay. Yeah, it kind of sounds like, in a way, you're trying to to map the the like the service mapping. You're going exactly. from the business app, the app service, to the application, to the server. Yeah, it's a poor man's way of, um, so before we were enabled to uh, install service mapping, we have to go through some rigors. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of those rigors, we're doing about 10 of these applications this way and showing how this is all going to work and the impact. Uh, beyond this, we're doing lots of things. We're doing capability mapping. We're doing information objects. We're doing architectural artifacts. Right, we're doing a, a variety of things, all tied back to these ten apps, because we're following John's John's wisdom. Right, show them the value. Well, the value is in all of that being present, not just having a pretty picture in in my in my business app table. Right. And then with your microservice, because currently with CSDM, and it's the examples that are out there and now create. Um, a microservice is basically just another application service. I think so. Yes. You look because... into the SDLC component layer as sort of the design or build component layer to as a parent for those microservices and those being also a child of the parent business application. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say I haven't kick that can yet so when you talk about microservices i'm not sure really where you're where, where we're going with that right we're that's part of this conversation today is for me to learn more about that right yeah I, i'm just showing you where we're at in the process and how we've got to i need help with these api you know documenting these apis just like we're we're trying to document 
certs, right? So tell me how to do it. Yeah, that was something we looked in. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say this is maybe been added, and I'm the one that created the microservices um data model example and now create. And if you take a look at it, even in his example here, there's the we set up the microservice as the application service that may be an application service that's connected to, and it may send data to or from other application services. So there's a relationship yeah, I'll, there. I'll, I'll cover that in my, yeah, I'll cover that one. And that's the legacy way and, and cover some of that, Mary. Yeah. Cool. All right, whenever you're ready, Mark, I think uh, that was your last slide. Uh, yes, sir. They, yeah, that's, I just, uh, that was way more than I was expecting to be asked. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Richard. Appreciate it. Yep, no worries. So I think everybody understands now where you're stuck a little bit. So that's perfect for Mark to get us unstuck. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right, you're going to take over share, Mark? Yeah, yeah. Hold on, Miss. Uh, just one second. My um, my system okay. locks up for some reason for a second, and then it frees up. So I think uh, I think it's free again. All right. All right. See if this works now. Is that working? It's coming. Yep. I see the whole deck right now. Yeah. All right. Well, at least that worked. Um. Okay, so so this is a, kind of a product direction deck. Um, I've got a couple other product managers on the call. I, I don't know. I don't know if Nick can stay along here long enough to kind of get to his content. I might skip around a little bit so we can address where we're going on on his. A lot of this stuff we're going to be stating is forward-looking statements, so don't make any buying decisions on a lot of the the, the stuff that's not available yet that we will be uh, uh, talking about. Um, so I've got a, a pretty um, large, I wouldn't say a large deck here, but this is a problem that's been going on for a while in terms of how ubiquitous APIs have become as a method of integrating everything, right? It, it, it goes back to what I would say is this mandate from Jeff Bezos at, at, at Amazon in 2002, everything needs an API. And guess what? Everything has an API and, and now everything integrates. Um, it's a little bit out of control, which is why I think that we're all here to a large degree. We're, we're not sure now what APIs are out there. We're not sure exactly how they're used. And that presents a problem. Um, it's super important now because there are studies out there from companies like IBM who have characterized that most of your uh, vulnerabilities are exploited APIs in, um, in cloud environments, as an example. So there, this is sort of just another one data point to use to substantiate the problem set. Uh, I think the vulnerability response, uh, SecOps, if you think about it that way, all those are the, the things that are driving a lot of what we're trying to do now. Um, they're, they're starting to appear in audit criteria if you're regulated, okay? So what APIs are, are, you, are out there? Are you securing them? Those are now questions auditors are gonna be asking. And there's a, also some challenges in understanding the data lineage, how information flows between the different systems in your environment. Um, I'm, I'm also getting a ton of questions on LLMs uh, as folks are integrating things in LLMs and data sources are going into LLMs that you're not really sure of. So that's a whole other topic I don't want to get into today, but uh, it's another one that, that's hitting hard. So the, 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 I want to start with this picture because of course it's CSDM and there's kind of two halves of CSDM, the upper half where you plan and build stuff and then the lower half where you operationally manage uh, use and consumption. And th these two areas are sort of the ground zero for a lot of the development that's going on in the product teams. Uh, some of them you already you kind of highlighted digital interface, digital integration. I'll cover that to a large, a high degree here. Uh, that can be a whole session on its own. 
uh, but I wanted to set the context on where we're in, we're investing on the bottom section, which is what where I have some of my product management colleagues on to answer questions about this uh, picture. Because to be frank, um, as an architect in my past lives, it's easy to draw a diagram and show how things are integrated on a, you know during design time. It's very very difficult to understand how integrations are implemented in the wild through the various technologies that provide that capability through middleware like Boomi or, or MuleSoft or at gateways like Apigee or Kong um, or, or just direct calls between app servers, uh, which happens a lot too, JSON calls or whatnot. So um, there's, there's a lot of complexity down in this space that we're starting to tackle. So, um, from that point of view, there's the legacy approach or the current approach, I would say, where we do have um, this depends on and sends data capabilities in the app services where we capture the information about how the app services rely on one another. This is kind of what Mary was kind of, was was starting to bring up. Uh, this is the the historically the level of detail that we were covering this problem uh, for a long time. And there's a lot of examples out there. And I've got a couple of them following this slide that gets into some of that, but uh, this is sort of the, the main thing that we have today. And um, it doesn't really have the clarity for the operational details. However, when you, when you say sends data to from that sort of thing, you don't know what data that is. <laughs> and, it, and it lacks clarity going through the middleware layers to, to see what's really happening if there is let, middlewares like gateways uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and I've generally seen cloud applications making this problem much harder to understand because your teams are now given an account on the cloud environment and those integrations are now managed by, by, the, by the team. And, and so what that picture looks like is becoming harder and harder to put back together for operational purposes. So, uh, so this is just kind of the, uh, the problem set, if you will, kind of substantiating some of the last discussion points. I'm trying to hurry to get to some of Nick's content in time. Uh, any questions so far? Any validation? There's a lot of chat stuff, but John, I don't know if there's anything in there that I should be addressing at this point. No, I think you're okay right now, Mark. Okay. Um, I don't want to get into the example models. We do have a number of example models that cover this to a large degree. Uh, as Mary kind of highlighted, they're on now create. You can download them there. There's videos where our, we record this walkthrough. Um, but they are, again, they use that legacy approach, this the current approach of just sends data or dependency model. Uh, not a lot of visibility on what's going on with that interface at all. I'm gonna skip that for now. So what, what are the new approaches? I'm, I'm gonna first cover for Nick's, <laughs> for Nick's benefit, uh, sort of what we're doing on the operational side. I'll come back to the digital interface and digital integration second, okay? Because what, where we're going and, and what we've already deployed is a class update called API, which extends the CMDBCI class. And, um, there's a, a, a larger model growing around that in order to handle a more complex data model that is operationally accurate. And the, and the reason that needs to be operationally accurate is because we need to support APIs as they're implemented with real technology in, in real data centers, okay? Or in, in you know, cloud or on-premise. So that operational picture needs to be accurate. Uh, so I want to pause here and allow Nick to kind of take over some of the conversation. If you're still there, Nick, I know you have to go. Uh, are you on? Yep. Um, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. So, so uh, I could go to the next page if you're ready or, or, or we can do you have anything else to say about the data model that we just released. No, I mean, this data model has been out for about six months and, and there's probably, um, Logically, there would be questions of like, what's the difference between like an API and an API component and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. The doc site does have a fair amount of documentation about it. And there's also a, a community article with some examples uh, of these things. 
Um, but at, at the highest level, the you could think of it like the API components are the individual endpoints, um, like explicit URLs or resources that are all part of one API. Um, so that's the, the biggest difference. They can live independently, but ideally, our guidance is to have that uh, that relationship built out between the API and its and its components. Yeah. Now, I'll also say a couple things. One is there's a lot of activity on the blog. There's a lot of folks that have chimed in, added their two cents. I would definitely encourage folks to to look at that blog. And um, it, it's pretty easy to find, and I can provide a link as a follow up. Uh, the second thing I wanted to me mention is a lot of this model is driven based on operationally ingesting information about the current operational footprint of a API and integration. Is, is that a cor correct statement there, Nick? Uh, yeah. 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 So with that, I want to give you guys a, a, a little bit of a floor to discuss a, a new initiative we're calling API Insights. Uh, that's the, the, the market approved name for this. And it will focus on that operational picture. So if you think about ITOM visibility as it stands today, the visibility portions don't really cover these API details and some of the sources like gateways that are currently in use. Um, so, so Nick or Ravi, if you're still, if you're on there, um, yeah, you, you can give a, a, a better summary of this than I can. Mark, I got one quick question for you. Are API components not just some installed software? So when there is a CI, like a web application, why would you need an API component? A APIs are a distinct element of the design of that software. For example, our platform provides a dozen APIs, okay? And, and it's all one software component, really, if you think about it, right? Um, and so it is a separate entity that is needs to be understood independent of, of the piece of software that's been deployed. Okay. That's the only question for now on there, thanks. Yeah. Hey, Mark. Uh... Chase Bryant here. I, I do have a question. Um, what, what's the relationship back to business app or application service that ties the APIs back into the business? So th that tie-in is, is not addressed yet in our current approach. Um, I do have a white paper. I don't know if I have sent that to you. I'm going to talk about that in a minute to discuss how it uh, could be done how it might be done, it, but it is sort of a feature. Um, but today we're sort of building this out from the two ends of the spectrum, the design end, which APM covers. Uh, I have a few slides about that in a minute. And then this operational picture, which is more of a discovery visibility point of view, uh, actual w implementation of APIs and integrations. So they will come together at the end of the day is the, uh, is the, the future goal. Okay, thank you. So there's a lot of uh, investment. If you're uh, familiar with service graph connectors, uh, discovery value, we, we are looking at a scope of gateways and data sources that will provide the information about what we're gonna cover in API Insights. The idea is this gives you operational visibility uh, based on these um, these implementations and actual use of, of APIs. Uh, this will be a dedicated workspace and that workspace will cover this, uh, this operational picture uh, of, of those APIs. Uh, this, from a monetization, from a cost perspective, uh, we're still sorting out the details of that, uh, but you have, th this will, align more or less with ITOM visibility and subscription unit pricing, the ability, because we're seeing a, a large number of these APIs that would exist that need to be managed alongside the software, which is a, uh, a simpler component. But I, like I said before, the, the software itself does not tell you how it's integrated or how gateways or mule software MQ series are, are implementing those, you know, those uh, APIs or integration points. 
From a timing perspective, uh, this has actually got a, a really short fuse in terms of our initial release of this particular uh, product in the innovation lab, so Q2. Uh, we do plan on covering some aspect of this at Knowledge. We don't know if we'll have a, a main theater type of thing, but we, we're, well, we will be able to talk about it uh, at Knowledge to a, large, to, a, to a degree, and we have a controlled go-to-market in Q3 planned. I think I might have lost Nick. I don't know. Nick, are you still out there? Anything else to add on this page? I think we might have lost him. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is just a high level overview of what we're working on from an AC, from an insights point of view and the form it's going to take in terms of a, a workspace to, to cover the operational detail. What we haven't done yet, kind of to your question there, Chase, is to bridge the gap between the 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 design aspects um this this has worked well in terms of how we've done things to put pressure on the app services layer if you will on the model uh, many organizations might have a good app portfolio uh independent of discovery uh what we're what we're trying to do is kind of bridge the two uh by developing capabilities from both ends and then come together in the middle that that's been an a a fairly effective approach to this problem. So looks like there's a lot of stuff in chat. Anything I need to address? It looks like. Uh... I'm getting a little behind. I was looking for that. Is that that uh, article on my, on uh, APIs? Is that in the CSDM forum? I, I, no, I will. I'll, I'll cover some details there. Since Nick has kind of dropped off, I'll get back to that detail in a minute. Okay. Do you intend application services to indicate dependencies to API, i.e., my application calls your API, or would dependency uh, exist instead in the application service that implements and exposes your API? It will be part of the application service because the app service is a is a logical construct. These are actual implementations, which is a more granular construct. So my application service may implement uh, hundred APIs. I've done this before my, myself. And, and those 100 APIs and integration points might have, um, you know, a much greater detail that, than what you would represent in, in a single app service. It might be a microservices architecture. Uh, so you have to break it down into a lower level. Um, so, so, yeah, there will be greater granularity in what we provide in this data model. But oh, auto, okay. more, auto, more automated, too. So the, the reason that we're looking at this more like the discovery process is that as anything changes with the configuration and use of the APIs, you know, in these other tools that you, that you may use already to implement them, uh, this model can be updated in a more automated fashion, right? So that's the idea. Awesome. And will APIs have a matching product model class? Uh, we're, we're not that far down the, ro the road. We just want to get the, I uh, would say, footprint, the operational footprint first. The product models is something that I address in the white paper. Uh, we could talk about that in a minute, but yeah, that, that will, uh, I, I think we'll come to that as well. I, I see these as technical services in the broader sense. Um, and if you're familiar with the IT for IT standard, we talk about human and um, machine consumption of what we call uh, systems in the in the IT for IT vernacular. I'm not going to cover that today, but we we already kind of look at standard ways of ca characterizing these um, these in in some of the new standards like IT for IT. Uh, there's a question from Jason. You have a hand up. I don't know if it's still active. Yeah, it's the one I, I asked in chat just now. I didn't realize we had to do it in chat. But basically, we're in the process of trying to do APIs now. Yep. Uh, and so we're excited to see what we're, what you're showing us here. One question we have is, is this going to tie into the CSDM information objects? So you have the actual information Lego that the API is using between the different systems, or is it going to be separate from that? Not directly. And... I could speak a little bit about what we're finding. A lot of the systems that implement the integrations like gateways don't provide that metadata or they are an open text field description of something which has no governance or control over. So from an operational point of view, 
this information is very, very difficult to come by. Also, if you're, if, if we're looking at, let, let, let's say, network traffic, uh, some of the, the contents could be completely encrypted. We don't know what that contents are, is, right? Or, or MQ series uh, payload might be. So there's a, a, it's not as easy to understand that um, the type of information at an operational level. But uh, we, it is, it is part of the reason we want to tie this to the design. Okay, so when we so, when we have the design context, uh, I and we'll cover that in a second. We should be able to obtain that information. Okay, so from a discovery point, I, I totally agree with you. It's going to be very difficult. But if we go in, if we have a data model identified that we can then align our business apps to, to say these business apps use these higher level information concepts or these types of information like PII, et cetera, that we can then tie back to some of these APIs. Is it possible to do that? Yeah, that that is one of the goals. And I, I cover it in the white paper that I referenced. I'll I'll I'll, I'll review that here in a second, uh, kind of what the, the the division is, if you will, in the paper. Okay. Um so uh, actually I'm gonna I'm gonna cover the what's next here after I go through some of the content that I was rushing through. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna rewind in this presentation a little bit. So when you see the presentation, it will be a little out of order uh, from how we're going through it. I wanted to, to take us through the microservices example really quick. Uh, the, the, the way we do things today, and we have, we have two different specific examples that we, we have out there, okay? There's a decomposed monolith, which is a typical microservices scenario versus standalone. Um, I'm not gonna take a long time to go through these because this is published material that you can see today. Um, the idea here is on a microservices situation, you structure a large monolith into smaller microservices that are each doing a different job. Um, this is a very simplified example of, of three different products used. One may be customer created, the other two are commercial products that are stood up and they create microservices, which are now interconnected in this layer of app services. So you have a, a high level app service that characterize the full deployment of, and of this case an, an online sales management solution. And then you have three microservices underneath that are each doing something for this overarching um, larger application. And I've worked on applications with hundreds of microservices. So this can get quite large and each team can be make, changing a microservice within this particular app uh, on their own. From the governance standpoint, it's still governed as a single business application. A lot of customers have struggled with, do I, do I govern it as one or do I break out each microservice into its own business app? And in this case, if these are entirely encapsulated by a single team for a single purposes, then I would, recommend um, from, a, from a management point of view, they all become uh, uh, under one umbrella, one business application and under one app service to indicate the uh, dependency view. Uh, this also ties down into the underlying infrastructure. If this is cloud or on-prem, uh, if you have virtualization layers, container layers, all of that would be articulated underneath one microservices potentially. And so that each one can be have a different footprint. So we do we do uh, uh, allow you to, in this model, characterize each microservice on its own independent stack. Um, from a API and integration point, we understanding how these microservices are integrated with one another is is not recommended because the the nature of the uh, of this and the dynamics of this is very volatile and what do i mean by that <laughs> if you try to gather all the apis between all these microservices owned by one team there could be a lot of noise in there and a lot of changes that you don't necessarily need to see uh, if you can get down to a single thing that's failing and understand the context uh, so uh, this is an area where i don't see a lot of emphasis on under needing to understand apis okay so I just want to point that out. Before I move on to the next example, which, which is uh, uh, kind of a standalone API kind of context, any, any questions about this? Lyle, did you have a follow-on? I, I don't know if you want to go off mute or did he hit it on that um, explanation? 
Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you now. Yeah. So you, you might have just answered it. So if I'm understanding things right, your API model is more about managing documenting APIs, kind of like from a, similar to your business architecture where you're looking at capabilities, which business applications provide those capabilities so that you can limit overlap in business applications and make sure you're meeting all your needs. It feels like a similar model the way you're looking at managing APIs. What I'm wondering, I guess, is if we're documenting APIs, do we want to document that my application is consuming that API? And if I do want to document that, am I creating a dependency from my application service to an API or an API component, or just to the application yeah. service that exposes that API, or both? Does that make sense? Yeah, or yeah. I'll, I'll cover it in a few slides. So if you just bear with me, you'll see. Yeah. I just want to cover the current state. This is kind of how things work today. Uh, from a microservices architecture, this doesn't change too much. You're going to see a lot more detail inside the application service that describes all of the underlying technologies and API, you know, CIs that make it up. Um, but generally, it's it's not so important here. You know, the, the, if you focus, if you if you're thinking about focusing, what areas do you need to bring that information in? Having the APIs at this level is not so important. Um, maybe this one, this next example will will fill in some of them. This this is an example where we we do have an API exposed for others to consume. And in this case, I, I'm just picking on tax calculation because you can imagine this is a widely necessary component within a larger organization. And in this case, we, we expose that API as a technical service that other folks can, can then consume. You can manage and monitor that. Uh, you have SLAs and, and commitments associated with it. And people are updating the, the taxation uh, model, right? But you, as tax laws change, you got to update this thing. Everybody can be on the same page. Um, and the, the current approach to integrating that today is really this depends on relationship. Um, you can look at, you know, the nature of this application service and guess, on, oh, this is tax data that's flowing by, by, right? Or maybe sales amounts or order amounts, things like that, which are characterized. But there's no information object uh, model there. And I'm, I'm and up here, we'll cover this in a second here with digital integrations, digital interface. You may have a similar structure to describe how business applications are designed. So this, this phone ordering system may be a completely different business application over here and have a different uh, design level model dependency between these. So uh, we'll, I'll, we'll show you that in a second. But this, again, legacy, how things are done typically with most customers today, uh, but it's getting a little bit more complex, but much more robust as a result. So Richard, does this answer your answer for what you're trying to do now? I think this... um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm looking at it operationally, John, right? How do I go and create the CI for the API? Right? How do I create the relationship? And I think somebody was talking about I want that, I want that that relationship back to the business app. I have to show that, right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so I, I'm, yeah. I, I'm gonna need some time to digest this and probably have some follow-up questions. And as I'm sure everybody else on the call does too, right? It's just yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't have too much more time to get through the rest, but there's a few more things I want to make sure I cover. It's really this new approach. And, and this has been a problem. I, I, I purchased a product called Systanet. I don't know if anybody here remembers that, but um, it was a, when SOA came on the scene and we had uh, technology like Wizdles, okay? And um, uh, we, we needed a way of understanding integrations that were available and, and managing those um, APIs and Wizdles, right? you know, SOAP calls, that sort of thing. Um, and and so I've been I've been around this problem a long time, and I documented a uh, a, a white paper, which has a kind of a long term overarching vision about this, uh, you know, going back to my Systemnet days, and it really focused on three key processes, which is when you when you deploy an app or create an app from scratch, you may provide APIs, and the first process is registering what APIs 
does each app even provide, right? Before you even integrate anything. The second process really deals with putting those APIs in a catalog that others can then consume. And in, in, in the white paper, I cover how to create a catalog. That's actually pretty easy. There's a missing component like product models. So I think somebody brought that up. Product models would be make it even easier, right? You can use um, uh, APIs as a product type, a product model type, and then do this. So um, this is this is something we, we think about in the in the paper as well. And the last thing is uh, deploying and managing integrations operationally, which is what I covered while Nick was on and how we're going to be collecting this information. Um, uh, from an operational point of view. The, um, if you think about how we do discovery today, a lot of folks in a robust scenario are saying, we're gonna be both deploying an app service and you may create an app service as a placeholder, plate non-operational. When it's deployed, you mark it operational and then you do discovery, which is targeted on the IPs that were changed or whatever scope of, of discovery that makes sense. So um, there's some best practices on how we can take this down to an API level as well using the same approach. But um, as, as the data models on the right are just the value streams that I've documented in the paper. I'll send this to you all uh, if you're interested. Uh, you can read through it. I'm on draft 13. I've been doing this. I've been working on this paper for about five years. Uh, so it's not an old, uh, it, it, we, we didn't start from scratch, right? I mean, this has kind of been thoughts that we've been working on for some time. So just a quick well, pause, yes, any questions? Please. Got lots of let's yes pleases and hearts on the uh <laughs> you said you'd give them out. Okay. Yeah, and just keep keep in mind this is a draft, it's not public. The reason is that some of these red items didn't exist when I first wrote it. Some of these items like digital integrations and digital interfaces do exist. And I want to cover that because I think there was a lot of uh question about design level. And we now have that. And and so I'm gonna, you know, I think we have some of the APM folks on the call. There's digital interfaces and digital integrations that can be documented. These are humans have to do this, or you need to be able to import this information from metadata that might be described from a third-party product as an example. But um, here you can you can describe the digital interfaces and integrations today and, and use this as part of your APM product uh, implementation. Um, this is just a screenshot down below of what those digital integrations do. And they basically, connect you know, the subscriber and provider um, um, information between those different business applications through those interfaces. Uh, so, so very high level, just a, a quick overview. Again, this is information that's already available. This is giving you an idea of the data model for the digital integrations and digital interfaces. And so it does incorporate the information object picture. Um, you know, because this is relatively new on the market, I don't see a lot of what I call mature customers these days yet. Uh, but I, I can tell you from experience, uh, a lot of customers are, are going to town on this, okay? This is a, a critical part of design and governance and um, allows you to do this. The one caveat, it does require APM licenses. This is the digital interface and digital integration is not an out of the box part of the data model it is part of the APM subscription. So you do need to be an APM customer to use these elements. And um, so that's that's one thing to mention. And that's why it's not currently part of CSDM. It is, uh, it's not common, it's not out of the box, which are some of our CSDM principles. So just wanna keep, take a really quick pause. I know other folks from the APM team are on this call and there's probably customers doing this already. Uh, any questions or comments? Anybody want to come off mute? I know there's a lot of comments, but I don't see any questions on there right now. All right. No, I, I'm, I'm hoping, sorry. yeah, it hits the mark, though, for some of the challenges that we're talking about still. So. Yeah, hi, Mark. It's uh, it's Dave Hill here. So, so, yeah, I would say that this does hit the market. It answers an important question that we have today on how to connect some of the application services we've created based on uh, your uh, uh, previous models for uh, deconstructed monoliths to a design object that we can then use for governance and things like that. My question is, how likely is it, do you think, based on where we are today, that this will become an element of a future CSDM uh, version? 
Uh, one of our principles is out of the box, okay? So whenever that decision is made, uh, that's above my pay grade, not in my uh, wheelhouse. Uh, we, we could add it to CSPM, but that is currently a, a, a value proposition for purchasing APM at this point. Yeah, but I would say that, Mark, it's very important that if, for those of us who own APM and have incurred that extraordinary expense, that in order to get true value, I have to understand how to, how to use that digital interface, how to take advantage of the artifacts, and how to mm -hmm. consume information objects, because we're paying for it, but we're not doing a lot with it, and you know what happens, not good things, so... Yeah, I mean, so that's good feedback. We can maybe cover this in a, in a uh, deeper dive session uh, or a video. I think there are some published things out there, um, but maybe we can we can have some sidebars on that for folks that do own that. I'll, I'll, yeah, Darone and, and Gerard are the product managers on there, and there's a big outbound team that's uh, there. I'm an outbound team of one, actually two. We just hired another person in our team, but uh, yeah, this, there's, there's a lot more folks on that team that can help out. Okay, so a good, good takeaway from for me at least. We can work with that team and get more detail on that. Yeah, we had Duran on last year, so it might be time to come back around. <laughs> yeah, Duran, I don't know if you're out there or Mark Casto, I think I saw you earlier. Yep, so I just want to say we're going to have a workshop on this. It is planned for next month on the digital interface, digital integration. And we'll kind of go backwards from where Mark has gone, starting at digital interface integration and APM and then how that ties in or will tie in. There's some upcoming uh, features in APM. I believe it's slated for May, safe harbor on that. Um, but that digital interface will tie into the API components that Mark was talking about. And yeah. I'm sure it'll probably play a part of that overall workspace that Mark was mentioning. Yeah, the, the, the trick is the change down here can be pretty dynamic. So the proper process is this information is updated first and then there's a change made and, and operationally we can then tie back to the original interface design spec, right? That's, that's captured here. Uh, so it, it's a process issue. The, the reason I, I wrote the paper is because you got to think of it from design down. Okay, design, build, then operate. And, and if you have everything robustly defined along that path, you can tie back to the design. But today, this is a rarity. I don't see a lot of folks capturing this data, right? We're just talking about it. It's there, it's in the product, you're not using it. Well, there's some definitely need because now you have traceability of the information that's actually built in those inter integrations. And that's super important. Okay. Hey Mark, a question. Um, yeah, this is Alan Prohaska from uh, from Kaiser. So, what it looks like, I'm I'm seeing a, an evolutionary roadmap in my head. You got a couple of um, app services, and then if you want to um, model, okay, they, they they communicate with each other. There could be the the simple relationship between them. You know, either communicates with or sends data to, um, receives data from, but. Uh, and so that would be stepping up level one. Then level two is we really need to know, you know, as you've been saying, what's the nature of that integration? What's the na nature of the, the data that's passed? And then that's that's when you would model um, you know, the interface between them as a separate CI. So a couple of questions. One is, um, would those would there be a pair of relationships so that the, the two app services are still related directly? And then there's another one that's three-part where they're related through the API, and then the second question is, um, there'd be a, a range of complexity you know, over all applications in the enterprise, and some may not want to go to the trouble of, it may not see the value in modeling the API as a separate configuration item. Do you see a, a heterogeneous environment where some, some, um, pairs of app services are have an API model and others just connect directly? And is that a problem? So That's a lot. Yeah, here in lies, yeah, you're, you're kind of highlighting one of the challenges we have because to achieve sort of the vision in the white paper, it really means you have all of this stuff established in the level of detail that we're kind of walking through now, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
and and any any bypassing of this right is is a uh a, a low a less optimal approach i'll just put it to you that way right um and customers are, aren't going to have everything all at once right at a at a high level of maturity documented so that you can realize this kind of mature benefit uh this this is a huge challenge for us because we have to support customers with many many permutations and uh there's no just one size fits all. Yes. But what I want to make sure that my goal, just, you know, when I talk to customers about this from a strategic point of view is to, to paint the, the longer term vision is to get you uh, eventually moving along. And we can break this down into maybe phases. Like you said, um, that might be a good way to characterize, you know, legacy and current versus where can you be next, right? That might be an easy way to break it. Uh, and, and we can, provide some material around that. I think I think this presentation largely does that. It was just thrown together last minute over the last week, to be honest, uh, mm -hmm. in response to an ask from John. Um, but I mean, we could do a lot more. To, to me, this is the boogeyman. A any digital interface that's out there that's unguarded, unmanaged, improperly um, safeguarded, right? That's that's exposure, going back to that mm -hmm. IBM report, okay? Um, mm -hmm. This, this, in my opinion, give, keeps me wake up, but uh, it keeps me up at night. Not much does, but this does. Okay. Yeah, and Mark, I would comment too, right? That, that you know, I, I get following the model, right? There's a series of things to do, but the problem we're having is the fact that every day, or not every day, at least once or twice a week, there's something new coming through the door, and it's coming yep. through the door with the minimum amount of stuff captured. And to now, I've just added tech debt, essentially. Now I got to go back and instead of it being part of the design phase to capture all this information up front before I allow it into production, now I have to try to go back later on if I if I follow that other methodology, right? And and I'm I'm struggling with with that. Just just throw Under, that understood understood. I I think if you're a robust from an up from a design point of view and robust from a from a discovery point of view, it, it's really just process details to work out the connection of the two. And I do have another slide that kind of covers that to a large degree here, but I, I don't know if I have time to, to get into it. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there is, there is, there's a, pro there's a process here that needs to occur. And, 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 you know, it's hooking into your CICD pipeline and uh, capturing this information as you go through this process, you know, from step one planning through deployment through uh, updating the operational picture based on, you know, the gateways or technologies that are actually implemented. So this is just a, a really high level, again, something I put together just to illustrate the point, but this is the sequence of events that uh, if you're tied in along the way, all this data model could exist and be used, you know, along the way. Uh, so. Mark, I do like your expression. Just process details. Um, that's sort of a that's sort of a not drawn to scale remark, isn't it? No, I know, I know. It, 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 it's, it's, it's like it's just it's just implementation, you know. Yeah, but the, you know, it, the hard thing is just getting the data model right. I mean, let alone the processes in, in which need to be integrated to keep the data model accurate. So, so starting with the data model picture, you can kind of walk back the processes that keep the data model accurate. Okay, so that the, that's kind of the, the approach. The reality that we've seen is that is that when your processes are con are confused or are overly elaborate, usually you can walk back upstream, um, and that's a problem with the data model. So that Understood. because because once you get the data models really settled and and everybody seeing them in the same way. Your, your processes get simpler, so. Yep, yep. Uh, and I just wanna leave you with one picture. I know we're a little bit over time. Um, this is our, our current service graph connector roadmap and inventory. And it, it, we added a whole new section for this because API gateways are such a big deal and this is gonna grow over time. Uh, Nick is on that team, Bye, Bob, uh, Ravi. I mean, there's a lot of folks that are working on this now and uh, you'll see some of these hit the market pretty uh, pretty quickly. So, yeah, glad you got that in. There were some questions on API gateways earlier, so hopefully that addresses some of them. Yeah, that. yeah, and we do have an ideation portal. If you have ideas or or anything, you can reach out to Nick uh, or Ravi, who are we're working on that. Um, 
So if interested, reach out to Nick or, or Robbie. Their emails are here. They're, uh, and I think I got, I, I forgot a period there in Nick's email, but um, Nick, not Ryan. Hmm. Perfect. And Mark, this is awesome. We really uh, got all our heads spinning. I'm sure we got a lot to talk about on the forum. <laughs> so. Well, the, the good news is we, we've been thinking about it too. Okay. And, and we have a plan. Um, is it perfect? I don't know. But we have a plan. We're going after this. And we um, hopefully we're going to solve your problems. That's the idea. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Um, and we're in it together. Awesome. Thanks again. Really appreciate this. And uh, we'll definitely be tapping this some pops this year. So thanks, Mark. My pleasure. And uh, great to see so many familiar faces uh, out there. Uh, thank you very much for your time.